Hi, this is Dr. A with a clinical chemistry review on hemoglobin. So uh, hemoglobin is a protein that transports oxygen, but also carbon dioxide. So it transports oxygen on the heme portion of hemoglobin, and then carbon dioxide can tag on to the globin portion of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made of four globin chains, two alpha chains and two beta chains. And each globin chain consists of 141 or more amino acids and has a fourfold structure. Uh, really meaning it has a protein coordinator structure um, and if you remember primary structure is the uh, amino acids and sequence of amino acids so what and in what order and then the secondary structure are the coils and beta pleats and stuff and then it makes a protein with a 3d structure and that's the tertiary structure but then if you take three uh, uh, the 3d structure so four of those proteins together, so the four different globin chains, each made separately, and put them together, then you have what we call a coordinary structure. So um, the hemoglobin has a coordinary structure that way. The um, each chain of globin, so each alpha and each beta chain, will hold a heme molecule. Since there are four, there are four heme molecules in hemoglobin. That, which means it can transport four molecules of oxygen for one molecule of hemoglobin. The majority of the hemoglobin in normal adults is hemoglobin A, or also known as hemoglobin A1. And then hemo hemoglobinopathies, which is, we're going to look at some of those, are diseases that are related to defects in hemoglobin structure. So uh, the synthesis of hemoglobin will occur in immature red cells in the bone marrow. 65% of it occurs in the nucleated red cells and 35% in the reticulocytes. Um, normal synthesis will depend on adequate iron supply for the heme synthesis and protein synthesis, obviously, to form the globin portion. There are two pathways to degrade hemoglobin, the extravascular pathway, where 80 to 90% of it occurs. Uh, so that's outside of the circulatory system extravascular and it happens within the phagocytic cells of the spleen liver and the bone marrow and then you have the intravascular pathway which normally is only 10 to 20 percent of hemoglobin that's degraded that way and that happens when um, hemoglobin is released directly into the bloodstream and is disassociated into alpha and beta dimers the hemoglobinopathies are um, a mutation in the hemoglobin chain, in one of the hemoglobin chains. Um, there are inherited variants, and there are over 900 identified different uh, hemoglobin mutations, and most of them are asymptomatic. So we're going to go over the main ones. Um, the first and most predominant one in the U.S. is hemoglobin S. Uh, it's an amino acid defect that is at the sixth position of the beta chain. And, uh, the globin chain, beta globin chain, and the substitution is valine for glutamic acid. So glutamic acid is supposed to be there, and then valine takes its place. It is the most common hemoglobinopathy in the U.S., and it can be fatal. The individuals will either have sickle cell trait, so they have uh, one bad gene and one good gene, basically. They have hemoglobin AS, so A is normal hemoglobin, S is the sickle cell or um, yeah, sickle cell trait hemoglobin and um, so that's the heterozygous state or they can have sickle cell disease which is a homozygous uh, state where uh, both of the genes for the beta chains or uh, the sickle genes to so the, the mutated ones. Black Africans and African Americans have the highest incidence of hemoglobin S or sickle cell. Uh, the hemoglobin polymerizes into rigid aggregates and uh, that makes the red cell assume a crescent shape. Um, and so as you can see here, so that would be a crescent shape. This is a normal uh, red cell disc and you can see on the smear uh, these sickle shapes show up. And then the problem is these uh, shapes then don't flow through the microcirculation well. Uh, and when they get in sickle cell crisis where a bunch of their cells sickle, um, you will see hemolytic anemia because those cells are going to be destroyed. And then basal occlusion, so at the capillaries and all that, these cells cannot go through, so they'll plug up the circulation that causes a lot of pain. Uh, and they can also get overwhelming infections. Um, however, it does give them protection against malaria. Hemoglobin C is also a beta chain variant uh, in which you will see moderate anemia. Uh, glutamic acid in the sixth position of the beta chain is replaced by lysine uh, and that results in a net positive charge for the molecule 
It is found in West Africa, especially North Ghana, uh, in 17 to 20 percent of the population and in 2 to 3 percent of African Americans. Uh, the hemoglobin C polymerizes and will form short, short, thick crystals inside of the red cells, and you tend to see these target cells on the blood smear. So these are target cells right here. Um, so that's hemoglobin C. And then you have hemoglobin SC, which is the most common mixed hemoglobinopathy. So it's similar to sickle cell disease, but it's less severe. So the hemoglobin S is the sickle cell hemoglobin, and then hemoglobin C is the one we just looked at. So the beta genes for the beta globulins will, call, will code for uh, the beta sickle cell chains and then the beta C. So we have hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. Uh, so there's no normal hemoglobin at all. There's no normal beta uh, that could produce hemoglobin A, the normal hemoglobin. So on the smear, you'll see target cells again. Uh, you could see some sickle cells. Uh, and then you can see hemoglobin crystals also, the hemoglobin C crystals. You also have hemoglobin E and hemoglobin D. So hemoglobin E is an amino acid substitution of lysine for glutamic acid in the 26 position of the beta chain, also results in a net positive charge. This one is more predominant in Asia. Uh, so about 20 million people in Asia have it, and 80% of those live in Southeast Asia. Uh, the heterozygous form is asymptomatic, and the homozygous form gives you a mild anemia. Hemoglobin D um, is a variant with electrophoretic mobility on cellulose acetate like that of hemoglobin S, but it gives it a negative solubility test. In the heterozygous form, it is asymptomatic, and in homozygous form, which is really rare, you see a mild anemia. Then let's move on to the uh, thalassemias. So um, in the th thalassemias is uh, there are disorders of globin chain productions, so it's a quantitative defect, whereas the hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C and all that are qualitative defects, as in you produce enough, they're just defective. This one, the thalassemia, is you don't produce enough. Um, and so you have reduced synthesis or one or more of the hemoglobin chains. So we're going to look at the alpha ones. Obviously, the alpha ones will affect the alpha globin chains. So um, for the alpha globulin, um, we, the genetics is that uh, each parent will contribute two genes. So uh, you should get four alpha genes in total for um, the production of the alpha globin chains. The, uh, we're going to go in the most from most severe to least severe. So hemoglobin BARTs, um, you have no production at all of alpha chains. There are zero alpha chains that were all deleted. They're all gone. Uh, and instead you produce a tetramer of four gamma chains and um, which is obviously incapable of effective oxygen delivery and so it could be fatal. So uh, these this is hydrops for talus uh, and uh, they don't live. Hemoglobin H, um, there's only um, the alpha chain production is to about one third um, of the production that should happen. Uh, and so you have one third of alpha chains to a full capacity of beta chain. You are, um, the patients that have hemoglobin H are missing one alpha gene. The beta chain form tetramers also of hemoglobin H and uh, you see a moderate hemolytic anemia. The um, alpha thalassemia trait, you have a mild microcytic hypochromic anemia, and the patient is missing two alpha genes. And so they have two and they're missing two. And then a silent, silent carrier for alpha thalassemia is only missing one alpha genes, and so they have three alpha genes, so they produce enough, which is why they're a silent carrier. Then the beta thalassemias, uh, so the genetics uh, for the beta uh, globins, they, each parent will contribute one gene, so you have two genes total, so two beta genes. So um, for beta thalassemia major, you have two mutated genes that are inherited, that would be in homozygous form, and uh, becomes apparent during the first year. They produce more hemoglobin F, which is a fetal hemoglobin, and they produce hemoglobin A2, which is evident on hemoglobin electrophoresis. You will see a severe anemia with red cell fragments and microsphericides. 
the beta thalassemia intermedia and beta thalassemia minor involve the de decreased production of the beta chains. They are usually asymptomatic, but you could see a mild microcytic anemia, and you will see an increase in hemoglobin A2 or D electrophoresis, the hemoglobin electrophoresis. A few other, uh, so modifying hemoglobin structures, um, they were also covered in the acid base videos, but uh, carboxyhemoglobin. Um, the binding affinity for carboxyhemoglobin is almost 250 times greater than that of oxygen. So basically, once hemoglobin binds carboxyhemoglobin, uh, binds carbon monoxide and becomes carboxyhemoglobin, it's not going to let go of it. So, um, and also if carbon monoxide molecule is bound to the heme, it will increase the oxygen affinity for the remaining subunits of that hemoglobin tetramer, meaning that they will hold on to the oxygen tighter, and so the oxygen delivery is not going to be optimal. So uh, carbon monoxide not only decreases oxygen content of blood, it also decreases the oxygen available to the tissues because it's not delivering it properly. Um, this is assessed by cooximetry and ABG, and as noted here, uh, this will uh, you get exposed to carbon monoxide through smoke, so um, fire, um, also gas leaks and stuff like that. Self-hemoglobin, uh, the oxygen cannot attach, uh, so it's a non-functional hemoglobin. It's a non-reversible condition, and it occurs after the ingestion of certain drugs, including the sulfonamide. So basically, a, a sulfur molecule will bind on heme, on the iron, and therefore you can't bind oxygen and it's non-reversible so I mean it has the, the hemoglobin has to be destroyed and stuff and obviously they can't take sulfur drugs anymore. Um, meth hemoglobin it forms after the ingestion of nitrites, quinine or aniline dyes. It is also a non-functional hemoglobin meaning it cannot bind oxygen and in meth hemoglobin the iron is in a ferric state instead of the ferrous state and therefore oxygen cannot bind iron in that state. So let's look at hemoglobin identification. So obviously, I mean, you can get hemoglobin quantity in a CBC. It just tells you how much hemoglobin is there, but it doesn't tell you like what the makeup of the hemoglobin is. So a normal hemoglobin profile, um, you would see 95 to 98% of hemoglobin A, 2 to 3% of hemoglobin A2, and 0.8 to 1% of hemoglobin F or fetal hemoglobin. The cellulose acetate hemoglobin electrophoresis is the first one that's done, and it gives you the, that first hemoglobin profile. But then if there are some abnormalities on there, you can do the citrate arbor electrophoresis, and um, that helps you to detect uh, more of the problems, uh, with more detail on the hemoglobin profile. There's also a solubility test, which is a screening test for sickle, sickle cell or sickling hemoglobins. Um, it is based on the principle that sickling hemoglobins in a deoxygenated state are uh, insoluble and form precipitates in a solution. Uh, so on the electrophoresis here are some of the patterns uh, of electrophoresis from origin. So in a normal hemoglobin, you would have your A2 band, hemoglobin F, and hemoglobin A, which would be the predominant uh, type of hemoglobin found. In beta thalassemia trait, you have more A2, hemoglobin F, and a little bit less hemoglobin A. Beta thalassemia major, you have A2, lots of hemoglobin F, and not hardly any hemoglobin A. And then in sickle cell trait, the hemoglobin S macrase dysuria and sickle cell anemia. So you have on sickle cell trait, you have some hemoglobin S obviously and some hemoglobin A. So you have some abnormal and some normal. In sickle cell anemia, there is no hemoglobin A. There's some hemoglobin F, a little bit of A2 on both here, but then you have predominantly hemoglobin S. You can also do uh, high pressure liquid chromatography for hemoglobin A2 quantitation. You can do the acid elution uh, stain or klein Becky stain for hemoglobin F or fetal hemoglobin. Uh, and the, the fetal hemoglobins will stain this really, really bright pink, whereas the regular adult hemoglobin red cells will have a more pale countenance and then you have to count them, count, count these and count those. So, um, and then you can also do electron spray mass spectroscopy to uh, identify different hemoglobins. There is also DNA technology. So the definitive diagnosis of some of the hemoglobinopathies and thalassemias 
involve simply doing uh the you know seeing the genetic defects and stuff but you you know in the red cell analysis and the smears and all that but usually you want to just do the dna analysis uh the dna sequence of interest may be easily analyzed from whole blood or spots of dried blood on filter paper the advantages is it provides a definitive inf information on the genotype of individuals tested uh, and sometimes uh, the direct detection of molecular lesions. Um, the disadvantages is higher cost and lack of availability in many labs, but that's changed uh, a lot. So genetic tests are becoming more and more available and less and less expensive. So uh, this is especially useful in prenatal diagnosis of thalassemia major and sickle cell anemia, and also maybe to know if you uh, carry a trait or not. And that is it. Thank you for your attention.